We can expect an unimaginable time of trouble in the last days, such as the world has never seen before. That's what Scripture tells us. But we need not be afraid. His word shaping our story. The year was August 1948, and a young preacher, George Vandeman, was preparing to take the pulpit. As he did so, a Sabbath hush fell over the new grounds as members mixed gratitude with happy hearts for the work accomplished and for their new auditorium. That was 70 years ago, and Central California Conference continues the legacy of Soquel Camp Meeting today. Soquel, an embodiment of America's camp meeting, has become a timeless tradition of faith intersecting with culture, pleasure bursting with praise, and truth uniting with tradition. It is camp meeting time once again. We invite you to join us as we worship our Creator together and let our stories and the stories that are yet to come be shaped yet again. You guys look good. It's perfect weather. The veggie chicken and tartar sauce will be available tonight after sundown. <laughs> I want you to meet a wonderful and dear friend of mine, Mr. Richard Hoover, president of Santa Cruz Guitar Company. I first heard of Mr. Hoover when I was leaving Monterey Bay Academy back when Alan White was still moving freely around here. <laughs> and, and I heard of a gentleman, a man who was building guitars in Santa Cruz. But I was not to meet him for over 15 years later. Richard, welcome back to SoCal. Thank you, boss. <laughs> now, in Fresno, so many of you remember when I was the youth director here, we took 18 incidents of gunshots at my house, uh, stealing my cars, little things like that. They, uh, my neighbor's car was dynamited because they thought it was mine. That's what happens when you baptize one cocaine dealer at a time. It's bad for business. And, and uh, my, but I, we could take all of that, but it was when my guitar, remember that lima bean shaped guitar I used to play was stolen. And that's when a friend of mine says, it's time to meet Mr. Richard Hoover over at Santa Cruz Guitars. And that's when I dropped by your shop here in Santa Cruz. That was quite the moment. <laughs> you still can't get over it. Yes. Um. That was maybe 35 years ago. Um, uh, you know, if you're anything like me, uh, you know, we, we beseech God to uh, show us his will, and sometimes he'll put somebody right in the middle of your path, and you'll brush them aside and move on because you got God's will to do. You know, you're busy. Um, but not this time. Uh, I'm going to say that the clarity of um, Jose, uh, God putting Jose at my door, or maybe more accurately, me at your doorstep, um, uh, was, was as clear as a bell. And the ensuing years, as we've worked together as a team, have been, uh, uh, you know, extremely rewarding and uh, strengthened my faith. So guitar making's a beautiful thing, but it's only a vehicle. And uh, together, uh, Jose and I, uh, with God's direction, can do a whole lot more than we have ever do on our own. So, thank you. You have now built four guitars for me, and those guitars. You wrecked them. <laughs> I re <laughs> you rebuilt one of them what three times? And, uh, you, they're not made to go to Antarctica, but God calls it there. Yeah? <laughs> I was in the North Pole, and three days later, I was in Guam at the equator. Extreme temperature and humidity differences just destroys guitars. And I just kept bringing in pieces for him to put back together. <laughs> and it's amazing. It's been like a team effort. It's been family. Amen. 
First time I walked into Santa Cruz Guitar Company to tell them that my guitar had been stolen. The guys stopped working. They're cross-legged on the floor, getting emotional, asking questions as I'm telling them, yeah, and they took my stuff. My guitar is gone. Dude, that is seriously awful. Whoa. <laughs> and, and before you know it, now, we're talking about Eric Clapton. We're talking about major guitarists around the planet have this man and his team build guitars for them. And then this little me from Fresno wanders in. Homie. A homie, yeah. Uh, well, you don't like it or what? <laughs> and ever since then, you and I have seen much, and your guitars are there. With this guitar and the previous guitar, we've seen over 60,000 baptisms. We've seen, we've seen almost 100,000 volunteers going out to 80 countries per year. We've participated in first response from disasters, hurricanes, earthquakes. Our people are on the ground and the Santa Cruz guitar is there as part of the effort. And I just want to thank you on behalf of the Adventist Church and a lot of people who have been blessed by your instruments around the world. Thank you for what you do and what you've done. Amen. Richard Hoover, ladies and gentlemen, president of Santa Cruz Guitar Company. I'm emotional today because a lot of my mentors are here. A trainer, a coach, is someone who identifies your gifts and teaches you how to use them better. And that's important. I notice you're a good runner. We're going to do some exercises, increase the capacity of your legs. Like I want you on a weight training program, an endurance program. I want you to run laps. Now I'm going to teach you how to run faster. Then we're going to strengthen your hands so when you catch the ball, you don't, hold, you don't lose it when you get tackled. So that's a trainer. Identifies your gifts and makes you better. A mentor changes the way you think. A mentor takes you to the next level. Richard Hoover is one of my mentors. You see, I wanted you to meet him in the flesh. Last time we stood here together, we held up the pieces of this guitar still being built. Remember, those of you who are here? And this guitar's been around the world two, three times. They just got back from Papua New Guinea. So already, what was in pieces at that last camp meeting we visited is now a functional instrument doing ministry full time. You see, he changed my way of thinking. Guitar ain't just music. I should probably, probably use more proper syntax. The guitar is not limited to musical expression. <laughs> it ain't just music. Music is the expression of the soul. It comes from the depths. Too many people foolishly are limited to music style. They think that music is about style, and you have your favorite style of music. No, 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 no. What repulses you blesses someone else. Music is deeper than. See, this is mentoring. And when I listen to Richard Hoover's concepts of music, it has an impact in my life. I may not bet, nobody in Nashville has asked me to play for them. But why is it that when I play my guitar, the Holy Ghost descends anyway? Well, he can't sing. I mean, don't tell him that, but my kid got baptized, and I praise the Lord for that. You see what I'm saying? That means music is deeper even than technique and methodology. Music comes from the soul. Now, take out your Bibles. We're going to battle. Open to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 10. Mark, in the New Testament, for those of you who are learning to move in God's Word, Mark chapter 10, beginning with verse 35. San Marcos capítulo 10, comenzando con el versículo 35. I know what you're thinking. The Spanish tent is up there. <laughs> but you invited a Latino to preach. You're stuck. <laughs> 
Oh, that's cold blooded, huh? That was uncalled for? <laughs> but I'm not sorry. <laughs> now, why am I doing this? Remember, I'm giving away my secrets to give you time to find the passage. Now, when people record me on the internet, now see, now there's where he breaks into his foolishness. I hate that. Now you know. The foolishness of my humanity is to simply give you time to find passage. Mark chapter 10, beginning with verse 35 and onward. If you found it, say amen. amen. If you need a couple more seconds, say amen. amen. All right, those of you who are nearby that person, help them find it. <laughs> Come on, help them. Because there are folks that are new to the Word of God, right? And they're sincerely struggling. And I want you to see with your own eyes the Word of the Lord. Had a wonderful church member who could not read or write. But he would say, please don't read the passage until I have it open before me. I said, but you can't read it. I just want to know that what's being read is sitting there in front of me. You see the power of the Word of God? See, I've been stalling. Why do I do that? Give you time. Yeah. He just breaks into these silly stories that have nothing to do with bananas. <laughs> if you found it, say amen. amen. Close enough. As we read the word of God, let's ask for his blessing. Father in heaven, may we not read humanity. May we read divinity. Speak now. Your servants are listening. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you, our Lord and our Redeemer. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. The narrative. Mark 10, 35 and onward. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto Jesus, saying, Master, we would that you would do for us whatever we will ask. They really do sound like kids, don't they? And Jesus said unto them, what would you have me do for you? In verse 37, then they said to him, grant unto us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left hand when you get to your glory. What a humble request <laughs> as nominating committee approaches where Jesus himself will be chairing. These guys have been fighting over when the throne is established in Jerusalem, who's going to be the new prime minister of Israel. And the disciples actually think that one of them is qualified to lead a nation. I have served at the White House for a good number of years, especially in the 90s and early 2000s. And let me tell you, leading a nation is not something, can I get it? I want to be first. These guys were arguing over who gets to be prime minister when Jesus declares himself king and kills a bunch of Romans. It's interesting how we change up the prophecies to fit our expectations and lose sight of God's plan. Okay, but where were we? Uh, verse 38, Jesus gave them an incredible answer. He said unto them, do you know what you're asking for? Can you drink of the cup that I'm going to drink and be baptized of what I'm going to be baptized with? Can you be beaten within an inch of your life and crucified? Uh, verse uh, four, 39, and they said, yes, we can. <laughs> and Jesus said unto them, you will indeed drink of the cup that I drink, and you will be baptized you, like I'm going to die. They were crucified later. They were. So Jesus very sadly says, you, although you don't know what you're talking about, you don't realize what's going down here, you will be beaten and die that way too. Verse 39, I mean, verse 40 but to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it will be given to them for whom it is prepared. Let's settle this right now. 
you and I are going to get to sit at the right and left hand of Jesus. Everybody gets a turn. I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, there you may be also. For those for whom it is prepared, I'm going home. I've stood in front of a few thrones, but I've never stood next to one. <laughs> they would never allow it. Security kept a close eye on me. <laughs> now notice in verse 41, this gets ugly now. The other members of the board heard it. <laughs> and when the other 10 disciples heard this, they began to be very displeased with James and John. Look at them. We've been asking the Lord to settle who's going to be number one. And those two punks are asking for the right and the left side. They're, they're triangulating this. They're settling a political dispute by, by smoothness of transition of hand. And, and look, look at how Jesus, almost like a parent, verse 42, uh, Jesus called them to him. <laughs> okay, everybody, everybody, look, come, 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 come. And he says to them, you know that they who uh, are accounted to rule over the Gentiles, they exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise power upon them. When you work with government leaders, you realize the enormity of the power they have over the people. And if you don't like it, they can crush you. You can disappear, never be heard from again. He says, now that's how governments function. They have power, they have lordship, they exercise authority, and then Jesus uh, looks at this and, he, and notice this in verse 41, but it will not be so among you. Did you hear that, church? Is this a Rojasian concept? This is Jesus speaking freely to his disciples. Are you a disciple? Amen. Are you hesitating? Are you a disciple of Jesus? Amen. Don't you ever hesitate again. <laughs> Jesus says today, it shall not be so among you. This overwhelmed me. Verse 44, and whoever, uh, um, oh, I'm sorry, let's go back to 41. It will not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wants to be the greatest among you shall be the servant of all. Amen. The ministry that I now lead, Movementum, is strictly focused on servant leadership. If you want to be great, be a servant. You want to be the greatest? Be the servant of all. That goes cataclysmically against everything we think and believe. Because we think if you want to be great, you'll be the first elder forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> you're a young pastor, so you're the youth pastor. I, well, I help with the youth, but I'm an associate pastor. Somehow being a youth pastor is perceived as weakness. If you're a youth pastor, hold your head up high because any church that has no young people is dead. And a church that's happening, pastor, pray for us. We have a lot of problems with our young people. Amen. That means they're here. How was it when you were young? I bet your mama would tell me some terrible... No, well, don't talk to my mama. <laughs> you want to be great? Be a servant. You want to be the greatest of all? Be the servant of all. There's no such thing as a self-made person. We must confront that. No, that... No. Can you please tell him that your dad started the company and is very, very successful? Yeah, so you have entrepreneurial gifts and skills that you were born with, but mentors took you there. 
and then you ran with the ball. There are people who teach at Juilliard because they were born with the gift of music, but mentors guided them to look even higher, and they reached heights unimaginable. Even Steve Jobs had mentors who pointed this gifted guy in the right direction. There's no such thing as a made person, a self-made person. We are all the results of the investments of others. There's no such thing as, yeah, I made it all on my own with these two hands. Liar. <laughs> what about your uncle when he taught you how to drive that tractor? And then you figured out how to improve on the, the harvest process, and you came up with that machine. That, but it was your uncle who gave you a love for the field, who got you over that hay fever situation. So you, everybody else is sneezing except you. Your uncle taught you how to ignore the grasses while you're cutting them. Isn't it true? Farmers are, you know, he's, he's got a point. <laughs> Others of you, I'm a city slicker. I don't know nothing about farms. I only consume what comes from it. But I fry it first. <laughs> you're a city slicker and you have gifts. Let me tell you something in the name of Jesus. I know that I'm nothing. My opponents are absolutely right, but that's the point. I, too, am the product of those who invested in me. Amen. When I landed at Monterey Bay Academy in 1975, I was traumatized because I grew up being told I wasn't an American. Kids would tell me, go home. I am home. We were standing right in front of the hospital where I was born. I was born right there. Now I went back. Go home, man. Go to Mexico, you people. What? Chocolate covered raisin. Brown on the outside, black on the inside. This is the height of the civil rights movement. Now, this is not political correctness. This was real terror. Getting beat up for being brown. You're not an American, man. You're not an American. Go home. I am home. Stop it. <laughs> Mommy tells me I'm not American. No, le hagas caso, mijo. Tú eres americano. <laughs> I was scared to death. So guess what? 1974, I went to Mexico. Come on now. I went to the motherland to see what this was all about. I arrived in Monte Morelos. I could actually say it, Monte Morelos. And if you say the whole thing, including the state, Monte Morelos, Nuevo León, Mexico because my accent is northern. It, it, I, I have a drawl, a serious drawl in Spanish, kind of like folks from Alabama and Mississippi have a drawl. It, okay, that, but I have the Mexican version of it. That's why in Latino circle, we like Pastor Rojas. He is so uneducated with his Spanish. <laughs> my accent is peasant Spanish, the, the Spanish of my parents who continue to be peasants to this day living in Ukiah in the Pomo Reservation because my tribe is Pakime. That's where my rich chocolate brown comes from. <laughs> I've had native leaders say, can you just shave that mustache and join the movement and help lead native ministries? I have my, my, my Ancestry.com I am 49% Native American. That's a hard one to earn. I'm 33% Jewish. <laughs> you know you're fighting tears. El Elohim Chad Yisrael, Baruch Hashem Adonai, Baruch Hashem Yeshua HaMashiach. I've been asked to hold meetings in Tel Aviv. So they say, why don't you just come home now and preach in Israel. Suddenly I'm being claimed in multiple quarters. <laughs> the Arabs found out, they said, you got to come out to Bethlehem and hold meetings for us as well. You see, I didn't know who I was. The first day I arrived in Monte Morelos, I was told, where are you from? Notice, it wasn't a question. I was told. Sometimes folks ask a question. Sometimes people tell you the question. Attitude. Where are you from? I'm from L.A. Oh, so you're an American. <laughs> no. I'm a Mexican. No. 
you're American, you're from that side. They don't even like us up there. I know. <laughs> but I'm a Mexican. You're an American. No, <laughs> yeah, where's my mom? 5,000 miles away. You're not a Mexican. You're an American, and they call us pocho. Nobody to this day can tell me what that means. So uh, I want you to meet Jose Rojas. He's a pocho. <laughs> that means you're an American. I come home, a patriot who loves my country, whose family has fought in all the wars since World War I, and I'm not an American. Now I go to Mexico, and people who look exactly like me <laughs> tell me I'm not a Mexican. <laughs> that creates crisis, ladies and gentlemen, and that's why you get into gangs, that's why you get into drugs. When you don't know who you are, somebody on the street is going to give you an identity. That's how you do gang intervention. You reach a child, you reach a teenager, son, sweetheart, you're a daughter of the king. You're a son of the king. Let me tell you who you are. If we don't tell kids who they are, if we don't accept who they are, a drug dealer will give them an identity. That's not a crime problem. That's a human opportunity for our church. That's why I was being shot at in Fresno. I sell cocaine. What about it? I teach Jesus, don't mess with me, I say. Amen. Don't make me pray for you, eh? I don't, I don't want to have to pray for you, I say. No, no, no. Oh, no. Uh, ya ves? <laughs> I'm in Madeira fishing one of our kids out on Sabbath morning. He's at the bar. I told my associate, you might have to preach. I'm not ready. We're never ready. <laughs> you might have to preach. Where are you going? I'm going to a bar. I walk in, I see the kid at the bar. Well, you have your soul, mijo. Oh, pastor, no, it's too late. I caught you, eh? I caught you, complete with an apron. And then the boss come out. If you're not going to buy a drink, get, hey, you watch yourself. I'll pray for you. OK, OK, no, continue. <laughs> Remember that one. Tell them you will pray for them and carry out the threat. The power of prayer is overwhelming to the darkness, brothers and sisters. 1975, oh, by the way, he took off his apron, and we went back to church. Amen. I get to Monterey Bay Academy, and I began to meet mentors in my life. Josh Rosado, we call him profe, short for professor, teacher, anyway. I don't expect you to understand, but that's just the way it is. <laughs> and one night, while he was leading students to give church services around Central California, it was about one in the morning, I'm in the van with him, and I said, Profe, I need to know, yeah, mijo, what? Am I Mexican? <laughs> or am I American? I really, <laughs> I really need to know. He says, without missing a beat, you're both, mijo. You're a Mexican-American, and don't let anyone tell you differently. If you want to tell me differently, I'll meet you in the back. We will pray together. <laughs> there began. I discovered who I was. I got into Leslie Goodwin's classroom teaching history. For the first time in my life, I understood European history, where all these Caucasian people come from. <laughs> the beauty of German culture, Franco culture, Anglo-Saxon culture, and even the subcultures, the, the Cockneys of that side of London and the Irish and the Scots, and then, and then over here, the, the, the Norwegians and the Swedish and, and the Swiss, and, the, and over here in Austria. Then we go, I, I was overwhelmed with the beauty of European culture, 
from a man who was born and raised in London, who survived the Blitzkrieg with his identical twin brother, Norman Goodwin, and these young men who saw war up close, who lost family and friends, came to become citizens of these United States of America like my parents did. And I came to love the many cultures of the Caucasian race. And I told my mom, these people are like, awesome. <laughs> All of a sudden, I realized the white man was not my enemy. He's my brother. I met another mentor, well, a bunch of mentors at Monterey Bay Academy. I, Betty Berg, oh, I took algebra with her. I am not a mathematics person. I can manage multiple million dollar budgets, but don't ask me to do algebra, please. <laughs> what is the value of N? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Ask one of my kids. <laughs> but I can turn in a good audited financial statement that the board will approve of. <laughs> Has nothing to do with algebra. I know an angry group of mathematicians are gonna meet me after, we need to talk with you. That was uncalled for. <laughs> I'm just confessing my humanity. I'm not a math person, but Betty Berg said, you know, it's like Jose, it's like apples and oranges. X and Y. Oh, I still don't get it, but... <laughs> 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 Betty Berg did not give up. Fast forward the tape. <laughs> Play. I have an office in Congress for four years, and we're negotiating legislation. And Congressman Frank Wolf of Virginia had a big fight with the president over the automatic sanctions provision of this religious liberty bill. And as an Adventist church, we're not about to ignore a religious liberty bill, but we were also opposed to the automatic sanctions provision because Congress is not supposed to uh, uh, levy sanctions, only the president. The executive branch has that authority. So I told Frank Wolf, I said, you can't do this, Mr. Congressman. And he says, well, you don't understand that the president is, and he used huge words with only four letters in them. And so uh, the, the thing that frightened me is that suddenly I was helping to negotiate a bill and, and, and all of a sudden it hit me. Betty Berg, Mr. Congressman, we're talking about apples and oranges. I'm listening, Rojas. Automatic sanctions is very different than confirming religious liberty in China. So why do we have to put them together? Why can't we treat them separately? Follow through. I want a team to sit with Rojas on this. Betty Berg made it to Congress. <laughs> now, it wasn't, it wasn't algebra, but it was deeper. She taught me something. By the way, I got a C in her class. I passed. <laughs> <laughs> Betty, if you're watching, I love you. <laughs> I love you, because educators want to know that they got something across. I did. <laughs> apples and oranges. That sounds so Central California Conference. Apples and oranges. That is a Central Valley phenomenon. <laughs> Unless you're from the Yakima Valley, and we're having another message altogether. <laughs> I took government from Josh Rosado. I used to think to myself, why do I need to take government? What does this have to do with a high school experience? I'll just be happy to have a job when this is over. And Josh would say in class, you guys never know. And one day he brought the local congressman whose district from Monterey included Monterey Bay Academy. He came and lectured and, and I looked at the congressman and I just said, how boring. <laughs> what a waste of humanity. <laughs> I got more important stuff to do. And, 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 but Josh stuck to it, and one day I'm at the White House, Amen. sitting with the president, and I thought to myself, Josh Rosado, government. He'd never believe me if I told him. <laughs> we are all the products of those 
who invested in us. There's no such thing as the self-made person. December 4, 1977, I get a phone call in the boys' dorm, and it's Pastor Paul Egan. His wife, Lynn, is next to him. He's one of our Bible teachers at Monterey Bay Academy. He says, Jose, we have a situation in the dorm, and I want you to handle it. Well, I sense the Holy Spirit upon you, son. I want you to go pray, and he gave me the name of the student. I know the date. December 4, 1977, at approximately 7.54 p.m., that he called me and said, I sense the Spirit of the Lord upon you. Go deal with this situation. And it was a serious matter. And I've been working as a minister ever since. Amen. You see, Pastor Paul Egan and his wife Lynn are prayer warriors. They went off to be missionaries in Zambia for many years after that. They're now retired in Colorado. They're claiming retirement like everybody else, like you do, but I still see you working. Anyway, I, retirement is a good relative phrase if you're into physics. We will not discuss my grades in physics. We are all the results of the investments of others. I became an associate pastor in the Fresno Madera district. I was put under Pastor Eliseo Orozco and his wife Priscilla. I was an associate pastor for five years. I finally went to Charles Cook, our conference president at the time. Remember Charles? Char Char wasn't he incredible? Stand up here with his cowboy boots and a white hat, and he'd move that leg and give us the latest stuff that the conference was voting on. Remember that? That man changed my life. I went to complain. I said, Elder Cook, everybody else been sent to Andrews after only two years. The guys are back with their MDivs, and I'm still sitting here in Fresno. It was 111 degrees yesterday. <laughs> What's going on? Well, I didn't quite use that tone, but I was thinking it. <laughs> the way I put it was, Elder, I just need to know what's going on. Am I being punished? Am I? I heard stories like this coming out of the conference before about other guys. And then Charles Cook did what all my mentors did. He changed my life. He says, Jose, we see such promise in you. We put you with our top senior pastor so this man can guide this bundle of energy and unload it with the Holy Spirit in a specific direction. Son, this conference believes in you, so you quit your complaint and go back to work. <laughs> Sir, we are all the results of the investments of others. You want to be great? Be a servant. All those mentors humbled themselves to be a servant to a little Mexican-American kid from East L.A., an attitude kid. Well. The Hispanic pastors assigned me to run the Hispanic uh, 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 Bible camp up at Camp Wawona. I took it with gusto, and the Lord blessed. The place was full of kids. And one of the pastors who has been a, a conference youth director in another conference said, Jose, you're a youth pastor. No, I'm the associate at Fresno Madera forever and ever. <laughs> Amen. And, and so, so, so he says, no, you're, you're a youth pastor, man. It flows through your veins. Kids gravitate to you. Little children come and hug your leg and don't let go. What in the world? My little Samantha seems to love you more than me. I'm getting jealous. <laughs> and I just didn't think about it like that. And then one day, I come into the conference office, and our associate youth director at the time, Jim Pimentel, and his wife, Konimi, and he says, Jose, this is successful stuff. Now, Jim is very corporate from a strategic and tactical perspective. I see real leadership coming out of you. Thank you, whatever it is that you said. <laughs> thank you. I mean, I was thinking that. <laughs> he says, I, I see something in you. And then when the, my, my wife did all the financial reconciliation, he says, we don't even need to double check it. Just run it over to the treasury. Whatever comes out of this couple, the Lord's blessing it. So I went home shaken, and I came back to Jim at the conference office. I said, Jim, what does it take to get into youth ministry? 
and he said, uh, you want to get into youth ministry? Well, I hadn't thought of it in that particular question. Do you want to get into youth ministry? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. All right, let me see what I can do. He went and talked to Dick Hamilton, who was the youth director at the time here at Central. And they, you could tell they planned it. Be formal, handle him. All right. And we made an appointment. Dick was there. We could have just gone over. Hey, Dick, he wants to get into the youth ministry. No, no. Make an appointment and come on back. And when I did, they had planned it to the T. Jim says, all right, now when you go in, tell them from your heart what's really, what's really burning in your heart. He's prepping me for the meeting. That is so Jim Pimentel. And so, so and, and, and uh, that day, uh, 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 Dick Hamilton wore a jacket. He never wore a tie and jacket to the office. He, you know, youth director, a shirt with, stamped with something over here. And, and, and he put his hands like this on his desk and said, what can I do for you? Uh, uh, I want to get into youth ministry. I think we can do something for you. Can you handle assignments? Uh, I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and after that, it was coordinated that Jim will fill you in then. And Jim took me out to lunch because Dick had other things to do. It was very formal. I was scared to death. I went and got my hair cut. That was impossible. My hair was down to here. And I went and had my split ends cut and had it layered special. <laughs> it was only eight inches long by the time the process was done. But we did not touch my mustache. Some things we will never do. <laughs> Jim began to give me assignments, and we launched a youth federation in the Bay Area and another youth federation in the Valley. We made the Constitution together. He liked my prose. He says, Jose, I, I only had to adjust two things to make it within conference policy. I think you have what it takes. And that changed my life. See what mentors do? They change your life. Trainers make you a better whatever you are, but a mentor changes you, gets you to think in new ways. Now, fast forward the tape. And I'm youth director of this conference. And the conference assigns Jim Pimentel to work with me. I was so frightened to have my mentor First day I told him, you're the ones to be sitting here. All, well, you know what? We can keep everybody in the dark. You handle stuff and I'll work for you. No, you got, you're the elected leader, Jose. I'm here to support you, buddy. And we went up on the other side of a mountain over here by Mammoth and the cutthroat, cutthroat trout, let me tell you, the blessings are abundant on that side of the ridge. But that's another message. All kinds of stuff happened before our strategy meetings. Long story short, I get called away to the North American division to be what? The youth and young adult ministry director of this United States, Canada, Bermuda. And suddenly I'm overseeing youth ministry to over 6,000 congregations, 58 conferences, nine unions. And I remember going into the office, <laughs> what am I doing? And I thought, Jim Pimentel. You want to get into youth ministry? Now, fast forward to 2010. Play. I know, that's completely unnecessary. <laughs> but kinesthetic people are, that is so cute every time he does that. <laughs> the rest of you, I can't stand when he does that foolish stuff. See, I'm not trying to just reach you. I'm trying to reach them as well. So what's foolish to one is exactly all, you know, mommy, he's funny. I like that fast forward. I want to do that with my friends when I get back to school. I want to reach children too, and they love those weird noises. Well, that's what the children's divisions are for, you want to bet? 2010, we're at the General Conference session in Atlanta. My phone rings in the hotel. Jose, this is uh, Homer Tricartan, my former boss. 
I'm chairing the nominating, co nominating committee here at GC session. You have just been voted the, the youth director of the general conference to lead our youth ministry for the world. And I stood there. Wait, 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 wait. I stood there. Jim Pimentel. You want to get into youth ministry? And I told my family, you guys, just to tone my voice, everybody, what? What? What happened? I've just been named the World Youth Director. I want to go home. <laughs> We're going to pray. So began three hours of prayer time with my family, with all my youth and young adults right there, who I think were, could evaluate this call. And after about an hour, our GC president, Ted Wilson, Jose, we want to take your name to the stadium and vote it. We're in the middle of prayer. If you, can, if you need a decision, it's no until we can say, oh, no, no, you continue to pray. Yeah, well, I'll call you back. We're not going to rush this thing. And after three hours, it was the clearest, simple decision, simplest decision in my life. It was not the call of the Lord for me to be the World Youth Director because I would be launching initiatives in all 13 divisions of the world. I would be chairing boards and committees all around the planet. I would be this important managerial leader and I'd rarely get to see kids themselves. This way, I'm on the ground in the field of battle with a small arm. You can't declare a territory conquered until you have boots and a rifle on a ground. Amen. Right, veterans? And so the Lord said no. And it was the right thing. Division Youth Directors still bring me in to mentor and train them. Uh, I need your help. I don't know how to run my division. I've got three countries that are rebelling. That's this how we handle it. Let's go negotiate with their prime minister over here. Let's go visit their president over there. Let's work this out. Diplomacy. Josh Rosado. No matter where I turn, I run into my mentors. I wish I could tell you that I'm that good, but no. The Bible is right. Nobody's good. No, not one. And then Jim Pimentel put it best. Remember, Jose, nobody's that good. Doesn't that sound like Jim to you? Those of you who know Jim? Nobody's that good. And he'll let me squirm and melt in the puddle. For... All right, I think I got through to him. I am clear, brothers and sisters, that I am nothing, but I serve a God who is everything. You follow what I'm saying? I know for a fact that God can take anybody and do anything through their life. And we have mistakenly been thinking that it's up to us to finish God's work, that we must finish God's work. Let it be known now that finishing God's work is impossible. You and I don't have the skills, the capacity, the patience, the intercultural and cross-cultural patience and love. We cannot do what needs to be done, but God can. The Lord said he's going to finish his work, and he's chosen to finish it through his people. You will be my witnesses, Jesus said. I want to watch him do some stuff. So I don't like how I preach either. <laughs> really, I don't. When my kids sit me, you got to watch this. No, I teach public speaking. I break every cardinal rule of public presentation. That's why the TED has not invited me to speak yet. <laughs> People saying, how come you haven't spoken on TED? Have you watched my stuff? <laughs> Nobody in their right mind would let me into a formal presentation because I know I break every rule. I'm an example to you, brothers and sisters, because you are my family. I have mentors sitting here, and I began naming names, but I'm sorry, there's so many more of you, and you know who you are. I love you. If it wasn't for you, I'd be a very, very happy upholsterer in Ukiah, California. <laughs> That's my craft. I do couches, auto upholstery. I'll give you a good deal. No, no. I, I, <laughs> 
You see, after I left high school, I thought that was it. I'm not going to go to college, but the Lord had another plan. Mentors every step of the way. Mentors every step of the way. I am the result of the investments of others, and so are you. And that's why, as I was freely mentored, now what do I do? I freely give it away. I am not a good man, but I serve a good God. And he wants to finish his work. He wants to finish it through us. He wants to take this hand and do stuff that they weren't trained to do. He wants to take this mouth and say things that it wasn't trained to say. He wants to take these feet and go to places we've never been before. He wants to take this body and be glorified in the community. He wants us to take care of the hungry. He wants us to embrace the ill and visit them. He wants us to go to the prison and visit the inmate. He wants us to take the foreigner and hold them in our arms and welcome them to these United States of America. He wants us to now say, because it was him saying this in, in that story, I was hungry, you fed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was a foreigner, you took me in. I was in prison, you came to see me. That is not liberal, that is not conservative, that is Jesus Christ's own mouth. Brothers and sisters, we are the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We have 69 hospitals including the largest hospital in the nation, Florida Adventist Hospital, and it's what, 21 campuses? I was out speaking to administrators of the Kettering Health System, 10 Adventist hospitals and growing throughout central Ohio, meeting with over 200 administrators on how the mission of the church can be reflected at the bedside of the patient, not just in the chaplain's hands, but in the whole crew's hands. We have, we have oh, 319 Adventist Community Service Centers. I'm sorry, Dr. Kwan, I know you're here somewhere. Uh, you have the exact number. I apologize for any difference in number. I hope, I know it's more. Probably 300,000 Adventist volunteers in communities throughout this great nation. We have volunteers up to almost 100,000 on good years who go out to 80 countries per year as missionaries. Brothers and sisters, we have ADRA that has a budget of over $300 million. No, not from your offerings. When they do development for a country, they use that country's budget to help them get back on their feet. Brothers and sisters, we have the tools. We have the assets. We have the people. Question, do we have the vision? We are all the results of the investments of others. Tell me, am I a Mexican or am I an American? You're still confused. I don't know. Jerry's still out. <laughs> I want you to see something with me. I want you to see with your own eyes what it, has to have, what it is to have a servant's mind. Those who have served in the United States military, please stand. Those who have served, stand up. <laughs> Active duty. Don't sit down, don't sit down. Now, I, I, if you have a knee problem, if you have a knee problem of pain, I, I don't want to put you through pain, but please don't sit down. Active duty, anyone else? Okay. Firefighters, where are you? Stand. You've been very busy lately. Police officers. Police officers, where are you? Stand. Police, highway patrol, sheriff, auxiliary, reserves, National Guard, please stand. Now look around, ladies and gentlemen. Look around. Listen carefully what I'm about to say. Ask any of these heroes, and they'll be the first to tell you, I'm not a hero. Servants are humble. They don't have a big head about it. 
They risk their life. And they say, I'm not a hero. When shooting breaks out, everybody's running this way. Which way do the cops run? They run that way. The building's on fire. Which way do we run? Out. Which way do the firefighters run? In. These people know that they might die. These veterans and active duty personnel, these police officers and firefighters, these reserves and National Guard, these Coast Guard auxiliary here among us, these people know what it was to put their life on the line for these United States of America, for our freedom. And they'll tell you, they'll tell you, I served. They actually use the servant term. I served in the Army. I served in the Navy. I served in the United States Marines. I served in the Air Force. I, I served as a SEAL. I heard those guys don't serve. They, but they'll argue, yes, we do. Don't you crack a joke about the SEALs. <laughs> I have many SEAL friends who have done impossible missions, and they still get home on time to go to church. Amen. My brothers and sisters, Look at these people. They're ordinary people that have done extraordinary things. Okinawa, Korea. Who here served in Vietnam? Look at these hands, brothers and sisters. Keep your hand up. Vietnam veterans. Vietnam veterans. Welcome home. Welcome home. The only soldiers that were spit upon as they got off the plane, they were, they were drafted. And then they came home from an unjust war that they didn't cause. Welcome home. Thank you for your service. You may be seated. You want to be great? Be a servant. You want to be the greatest of all? Be, you just saw examples. Be the servant of all. Now, if we understand servant leadership with a uniform on, why can't we understand servant leadership as civilians? Are you willing to give your life for that homeless man down there? Are you willing to give your life that somebody else might live? Brothers and sisters, this is a call for revival. This is a call for revival. We need our faith revived. We become cynical. We are at each other's throats. We no longer listen to a sermon to be blessed. We listen to make sure everything is proper and that Ellen White is utilized accordingly. We don't listen to learn anymore. We listen to make sure it's our view. We need to open our hearts and be softened by the power of the Holy Spirit because that community out there is dying and they're waiting for us. We have all these assets. It's time to use them. Does this make sense to you? See, you didn't come to camp meeting to be entertained. Yeah, they have really nice church service, incredible music, everything's, and then the food. Veggie chicken with tartar sauce. <laughs> Then when you get home, you get back to vegan. <laughs> you buy a book for three bucks, I'm telling you. You can get a stack of Bibles for six bucks a piece. All of that is true. Is that why you're here? I want to say to my mentors, many of you, I can only mention a few. Eliezer Benavides also, Elias Gomez, Isaac Lara. Dr. David and Maxine Taylor, all you mentors who impacted my life, thank you. All you SoCal campers that have shown kindness to me since 1975, are you going to play your guitar today? No, nobody's asked. I'm glad you have it anyway. I played for a gopher over on this side of the meadow. <laughs> gopher kept peeking out. I went, no. What in the world is going on out there? We're trying to sleep her out here. <laughs> this is SoCal. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, 
My ministry calling when I left the General Conference was a positive experience. It was simply a call to launch Movementum. I was flying up to three and four times a week. When they know you by name at Atlanta Airport, that's the busiest airport in the world. When the Lord comes, we're going to go through Atlanta. <laughs> and there will be delays because of weather. <laughs> I heard it's going to be really cloudy that day, very bright clouds. When they say, Dr. Rojas, where are you going today? And it's my third time through Atlanta that week. That is shameful. When, 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 when Holiday Inn says, thank you for your 72 nights with us this year, when I got a wife and four kids back at the house, it suddenly dawned on me, I'm ready for the next level of my existence of ministry. My mentors taught me that. Nobody's that good. So my brothers and sisters, if nobody indeed is that good, imagine what God can do through us. If we can confirm that we don't have what's needed, this gives God the chance to show us through our life what he can do. And so that gives me a sense of peace. So I, as, where I used to fly three and four times a week, I have flown four times in the last year. Amen. I'm now driving. <laughs> Which means I do one or two circuit drives per month. I'm at home with my family. And brothers and sisters, what are you going to do to change your journey? How is this going to get better for you? How are you modifying what you do for the Lord so that you keep your health and make it happen further? Let me tell you. I went to Ohio to meet with the administrators of the health system. Two days of unnecessary roughness. You bring me in, there's going to be body slamming. I thought this was a presentation on medical ethics, and yet yeah, it is. Dude, <laughs> it is. When atheist physicians said, I'm fascinated by this. This is more than an argument for divinity. This is a demonstration of what a divine presence can maybe do in our community. And I said, exactly, doctor. So what you gonna do about it? <laughs> the doctor said, I find this man fascinating. Where are you from? East L.A. <laughs> Who's asking? I am fascinated. I, I'm from Cleveland. It's good to make your acquaintance. <laughs> I met an egghead. He was so smart. He was a giant brain with little feet on it. <laughs> I knew my place. After that, I drove down to Cincinnati for the Youth Congress, because I will never stay away from young people. Now, you think this was rough. Join me with the young people on Tuesday night. That's when the gloves come off. <laughs> Poor kids, like, he really let us have it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and brothers and sisters, I went from there to the Southern Union Evangelism Summit. Their delegates, they met at Southern University. Drove down there and spoke the plenary after the banquet. And then I got on the road and drove down to South Texas to, to, to McAllen and Brownsville for the Texas Conference Evangelism Summit. Then I drove home, a circuit ride. And I discovered now that all I'm asking the Lord for, I have a really nice truck that I was able to find in Loma Linda. Luckily, this doctor only went to Safeway, to church, and to work. This truck sat in his garage year after year. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and he gave me the deal of the century. You want that? I already bought another one. And he gave me a deal. I'm praying now for a small Airstream trailer because here's what I'm telling you. I need something light, something that doesn't need maintenance every Sunday afternoon. I'm not putting it down. I just know I've had a family with trailers and campers. 
and a lot of glue for the stop leak stuff and the toilet that never quite got with the program. <laughs> I'm going to confess publicly what the Lord has called me to do. It is time to publish. It is time to write. My body can no longer handle constantly being flown around the planet and do everybody's speaking for them. We shouldn't have favorite speakers. We should only have a favorite God. Yes. Your heroes should not be great preachers. Your heroes should be the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes. And then that shines in the community. And, and, and I need to publish. Remember, Ellen White was a great speaker, but we don't remember her for what she said. We remember her for what she published. I have 14 manuscripts on the hopper now. It's going to get ugly. And I'm telling you right now, I want to evangelize the world. I'm, I'm saying it in humility before my mentors. It's time to take this health and focus it in a way that will judiciously distribute the energies I have so that I don't die young. I'm right now years old. <laughs> and I'm too young to be this tired. Now, some of you, he's just a kid. But others are like, the dude's old, man. <laughs> Some kid back there, Jurassic Park, man. <laughs> Velociraptor chased him on his way to class at NBA. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, the Lord has a plan for your life. What you gonna do about him? We're gonna conclude with a special prayer. I want you to think about this. Has the Lord called you to the next level? Are you ready for revival and reformation in your own life? Or will you stick to your opinions forever? I continue to lay my opinions aside every time the Lord sends me another mentor to impact my thinking. Put on the mind of Christ, the apostle said. I'm going to sing this song in the name of Jesus. If you want to be a part of this prayer of consecration, use me, Lord. Here am I. Send me. Come on up here so we can close in prayer together. Just come on up as I sing this song. <clears throat> All to Jesus. Jesus, I surrender all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence and daily live. All to Jesus, I surrender humbly feet I bow. Oh, the joys of full salvation. Take me, Jesus. Take me now. I surrender. I surrender. All to thee I surrender, oh, sing with me, stand. I surrender, oh, I surrender, oh, all to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender, oh, one more time, now that you're sure. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, I surrender
Never forget this day. On this day, the Lord confronted us. There's a work to be finished. If it has been hindered, it is we who have hindered it. It is time to be men and women of valor. As our veterans demonstrated, we are capable of serving. We need a movement of servant leaders. You want to be great? Be a servant. You want to be the greatest of all? Be the servant of all. That's what we're needing now. Otherwise, we're going to eat each other alive and not even care about each other's pain anymore. That is not the Jesus that we serve. Are you in? Yes. Military personnel will recognize this language. Look at me. We're going in. The enemy's dug in. He's had 6,000 years of experience. He thinks he has the high ground. He's gotten cocky. He thinks he's going to win. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We're going in. So lay aside your doubts. Some of you don't even get along in the barracks. But out here, we're brothers and sisters. We're going to have each other's back because this enemy will be vanquished. This mission will be fulfilled. Are you ready? I was there when troops were loading at Aviano Air Base for major classified impossible missions in Bosnia. And every last Marine came back. Lay aside your doubts. I know you don't all get along in the barracks, but we're brothers and sisters in this cause. Let's get it done Amen. in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus Amen. I'd like to say to the administration of this conference it has been my honor to serve before my family in this service I pray that your prayers have been answered if this was too much for you just don't invite me back <laughs> but next week Probably, in my estimation, one of the greatest, if not the greatest preacher in the Adventist Church on planet Earth, Elder Wright, will be here. You don't come here to hear good preaching. You come here to be led by the Spirit of God so that when you go home, this stuff gets finished. Are we in? Yes. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, bless your people once again. Pour out your Holy Spirit among us, or we will ruin each other. Forgive us of our many sins against you and against each other. There are folks here that are bleeding from the beatings they've gotten from our own people. Forgive us for when we eat our own. Raise us up. May we learn to look a little higher. Thank you, Lord, for my mentors. I just saw another one. Brian Neal is here, Lord, from Southern California. Men and women who impacted my life, Lord, I am but a result of their investments. I am not a good man, but thank you that you're a good God. May we all learn, Lord, that if we want true greatness, we will serve. So now, after shoving us and slapping us around this morning, take us back to our meals. Make this the, the conversation of our meal. Provoke us, Lord. Mentor us. Give us the mind of Christ. May we think in a new way. We pray in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen.
Look at me. Don't talk. Look, 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 look at me. Go. Go. Tell someone what you have seen. Don't subtract from it. Don't add to it. Don't say, if only he'd shave, I'd listen better. <laughs> Go. Tell someone what you have seen. Go in peace. We would like to thank the constituency of the Central California Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church for making this program possible and from viewers just like you. Thank you.